Replacement reactions. Uh, I don't remember how exactly far we got into it. I'm just going to erase that statement so we don't look at it. Okay, but if we were to look at each of these reactions, what you are expected to go through and do uh, is predict them. Okay, so it looks like what we went through and did was we predicted that zinc with lead. Yes. So we could go through and predict because the zinc and lead are both metals that they would exchange, and I would expect zinc to pair up with the sulfate and the lead to chill out by its own. Okay. And then they will also switch phases. So the lead should come out as a solid because it's now by itself, and the zinc should come out as aqueous. Okay. <clears throat> when we predicted phases with double replacements, we had more information. We had to use the solubility rules to help us out. Predicting phases with single replacements, I would actually argue just exchange the phases, line them up. The thing by itself gets a solid. The thing that's with something else becomes aqueous. And then we can evaluate secondary aspects behind that. Those secondary aspects become much more challenging to deal with. Okay? So we just make the swap, and then let's think about it a little bit. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. To that end, that makes it more difficult at the same time. Because with the double replacements, you're expected to predict, did a reaction happen? Well, how did we predict if a reaction happened in the double replacements? How do we know it was a chemical change? There has to be a change in phase. Well, is there a change in phase here? You might say no, because it's solid aqueous and solid aqueous, but the species that is solid is different. So there is a phase change. Does that mean a chemical reaction happened? If the reaction happened, yes. Do we know if the reaction happened? Okay, so in the case of the double replacement, we're predicting everything out, so we know that the reaction happened. In the case of the single replacement, we don't know that, because okay, we'd have to know some more information that makes it a lot more challenging. So what we end up going through and doing is just predicting our equation first, and then we got to decide if. So we used the lottery analogy. Yeah, we did, because you, was it you, Rose, with the costumes? Somebody said something about costumes, which is going to be now my thing. Okay. Told it to the afternoon class, and they're like, you better show up in costume on Thursday. And I'm like, I'm not winning the lottery, so. No. Okay. So, so uh, <laughs> well, that is something I've actually decided that if I won the lottery, I would definitely still teach. Yeah. Um, so I just like it. So zinc and lead. Okay. This is where we have to use the activity series to do an interpretation. Okay. You'll get more on the activity series in lab. So we would identify zinc, I see your hand, and I saw it, and I was going to come back to you, and I forgot. What was your question? So could a gas like oxygen or fluorine be... Um, could we use non-metals in single replacements? Yes. Um, I'm going to give you a second to practice some of these. Uh, during that practice, what I'll have you do is predict the bottom two, and I will change this middle one, the magnesium one, to an example with non-metals, okay. and we'll look at what that looks like. Because yes, you can. There's some gray area there, but yes, you can. Okay. So how do we use the activity series? Okay. Well, the more active it is, the more likely it is to be found with other things. Okay. The less active it is, the less likely it is to be found with other things. So if we go through and take a look at this, since zinc is higher up on the activity, it should be with things. Okay. One of the extra things we'll add with this is it'll be with things or, okay, and it's not going to make sense in this case, but it will make more sense in lab, or it will be ionic. Okay. Lead, since it is less active, wants to be by itself. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to blame Greg for that one. Been around Greg too long. Okay, whoops. Or we'll specify that as a solid. Okay, or metallic. Okay, which really only holds for us doing single replacements with the metals. Okay, so if we went through to look at this, zinc being higher on the activity series wants to be with things. So let's take a look at our chemical expression. Where is zinc with things? 
in the product. So I'm going to go ahead and underline that because that's an important thing for zinc. Zinc prefers to look like that. Okay, we could do the same thing with lead. Lead wants to be by itself. Where is lead by itself? In the product as well. So how do we use this information? Well, if I'm running a reaction, I mix the reactants. So I mix the reactants and what happens? Now the chemicals get to decide, should we react or not? In that case, we can evaluate what zinc wants to be. Does zinc want to be by itself or does it want to be with other things? With other things. So what happens? Zinc sees that lead's with stuff and says, lead, I'm just gonna take that stuff from, from you because I have a higher tendency to be, be with things. So zinc will go in to join with the sulfate, but then that chases the lead out. Well, that's good because lead was lower in activity, doesn't want to be with things. So zinc and lead exchange their locations based off of their activities. Yes? So on that chart, what element would you say would, would start to go determine more to be solo than with something? Lower on the chart means solo. But is there a point where they'll prefer more to be solo than with something? It's always a comparison. Because I can take zinc. Zinc wanted to be with things, right? But if I mix it with sodium, zinc com comparison to sodium does not want to be with things. Zinc would want to be by itself. So it's always a comparative system. Do you have a question? No, you just had a no, smirk on. I was just checking. No, I just came up with like a thing in my head to help me memorize it. Okay. There's lots of weird things that you can do with this that usually get me in trouble. So <laughs> we're just going to stick with what we got right now. Okay? Does that make sense? So we got two equations down below. Go ahead and do this process. I want you to predict what it should look like. Okay, what should those products be? Get all the phases in there. And then also decide, should that chemical reaction happen? While you're working on that, I will try and come up with a single replacement reaction that does not involve metals. Okay. We're going to talk through it. So hopefully we've got a decent idea down on some of this. We'll address that one too. Okay. Um, We'll address that one. It's a little bit more challenging than you would hope. So <clears throat> what I've got nice and colored where that magnesium one was is still a single replacement reaction. We go through and look at our reactants. It's chlorine, potassium, and iodine. Right? Potassium's a metal. Chlorine's a non-metal. So I can't exchange the chlorine for the potassium because they're not the same class. So I'll have to exchange the chlorine for the iodine. Which means when I go through my replacement, I'm going to end up with iodine by itself. And then I'm going to pair up the potassium with the chlorine. Note there's some interesting changes here. This says I2. What happens when iodine goes by itself? It's like hydrogen. It's like hydrogen. Okay? It has to be diatomic. It has to be diatomic. So as soon as iodine is now by itself, I have to specify it as I2. That's where the 2 comes from. Okay? When I go over to the potassium chloride, you'll notice I don't have a 2 next to the chlorine there. Why, why not? There was a 2 over here. What did that 2 mean? Why is that 2 in chlorine present? It's, two. it's diatomic. Because it is diatomic, I have to include the 2. That's the cold okay, in, our, in our statement. When I exchange across, it's no longer just diatomic. It's not chlorine all by itself. It's chlorine with something else. So now I have to decide what is the proper formula for potassium with chloride. How would I decide that? The, uh, you do the, the individual charges for potassium and chloride. The charge for potassium is one. plus one. The charge for chloride is negative. negative one. How many do I need of each? One, one of each. Okay, to make that formula correct. Okay, then the equation wouldn't be balanced, so I went through and added the coefficients to make that equation balanced. So it does work if it's a non-metal. Okay? The thing that becomes a little bit more challenging for you is let's decide if this reaction happened. Uh, sorry, let's rewind back from that. Notice we've got phases in here. Notice the phases are all entirely different. Okay, why? Because this reaction isn't an easy one to happen. To force this reaction to happen, we're mixing these things together and we're usually pumping a bunch of electricity into it. So this isn't really just solid, it's actually, and it's a molten state, so we've heated the living bejesus out of it to get it to actually melt. Okay.
okay? And then we're probably bubbling the chlorine through, okay? In that exchange, we're exchanging the chlorine for the iodine. So we could think about activity, which one's more active. So we should look for chlorine and iodine in our list. Chlorine's more active in our list. Let's look for chlorine. Oh, it's not on the list. Okay. It is an example single replacement. Typically, when we're talking about our single replacements, we're referring to the metals being involved in the reactions, and we tend to ignore the nonmetals. Why? Because it's 130. We're trying to make it simple. Okay. So you aren't expected to predict those in this class. You should be able to recognize that it does fit the pattern. You just don't understand necessarily how or why it would work. Make sense? Okay. So I just want to erase that equation now so it just cleans up some space in here. If we go down to our standard metal one, it's a little more straightforward. We do the exchange, which is fantastic. Okay, we find the most similar things. Silver is a metal, aluminum is a metal, we swap them. Aluminum by itself, silver's with the chloride. Okay, that's a phenomenal first step. Okay, but the next step is we have to evaluate, did we actually do that appropriately? What is the formula for just aluminum? Aluminum, uh, diatomic. Just aluminum. Yeah. That, one, that was actually a decent one. What's its phase? Solid. Solid. We know that because we could look at the periodic table. So now let's move over to the silver chloride. Okay. The reflex, and I fully understand this because we're just doing that exchange, is you kept all of the numbers that you had on the other side. Okay. So let's evaluate the meaning of those numbers. Why is there a 3 next to the chlorine in aluminum chloride, this red 3? Aluminum is a plus 3. Chloride's a minus one. I have to have three chlorides to balance it. Okay? That's why it's there. If we go now and do your single replacement and you swap it out, why did you write the blue three? Habit. Habit. It's just a copy over from over there. The red three was there to balance aluminum. Is it with aluminum anymore? No, so that three, and I'm not saying it's wrong, and that's where it becomes challenging, because sometimes it's right, and you're like, well, see, it's right. It's right for different reasons. You really have to understand that reason, and that's why this one was picked here. Okay? So let's look at that reason. For that reason to be true, for why that would be a three, you would need three chlorides to balance the silver. Chloride we already established was a minus one. Hold your thought on silver's charge, because we have a potential question. So the exchange is still happening, okay. but the exact ratio with which it is exchanging is different. Okay. Right? So but let's say you have hundreds of dollars, right? And someone bigger comes along and sees you. They could rob you of your money, right? Does that mean they're going to rob you of all of your money? Or did you hide some in the bottom of your shoe that now prevents the full exchange? And that's kind of what's going on with that, is that you're not getting a perfect swap across. Okay. Ultimately, the entire equation has to be balanced, so it has to balance out. But we aren't addressing the balancing of the equation yet. We have to balance each of the results first. Okay. And that balancing of the results becomes challenging because you want to just reflex it. Just say, oh, it just swaps. It doesn't just swap. There has to be a reason for that swap. Yeah. But, but silver doesn't displace aluminum. I think silver the, is. Activity. Yeah. That's a different question because we aren't even there yet. Okay. So I know we. That's, I that's know where question. that's potentially going. Okay. We're not there yet because the first thing that we were asked to do is to predict what would happen. Okay. You are trying to plan what happens if you win the lottery. That doesn't mean you won the lottery. Okay. I was just trying to translate. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, so, Sorry. it's okay. So, why is the three? Three's not there. What needs to be there? Nothing. Nothing. Because silver is a plus one, chloride's a minus one. Okay, what should the phase be on that? Aqueous. Okay, as far as we're concerned, that's aqueous. How would we know what the phase was for ionic things? 
How would we know what the phase was? One of what rules? Yes. I like where you're going with it. Solubility, solubility rules. Okay, and if we look up the solubility rules, it turns out silver chloride is actually not aqueous. Okay, so don't stress about that because that's now refining multiple levels. Okay, so let's just stick with it being aqueous. So is our equation balanced? No. No, so balance the equation. There's still two So what would I need? I need a three there, so now the chloride's balanced. And I need a three in front of the silver. Once we've predicted what could happen, now we've got to decide what did happen. And that what did happen, we now need to move to the activity series. Okay? When we look at the activity series, we need to identify the metals in our activity series. And what do we have? Silver and aluminum. Which one is more active? Aluminum, which means it wants to stay with something else. Which one's less active? Silver. Silver, it wants to be by itself. Okay. When we mix those two things, does silver want to change its state? No. No, it wants to be by itself. This is why we underlined it, which means when I mix the reactants, what happens? No. I just get reactants. They don't actually run a chemical reaction. So we would say no chemical reaction. So where you might have potentially been going, either you're saying, well, I could have predicted that there was no chemical reaction. That's true. How good are you at balancing an equation? How good are you at predicting products? Okay. So maybe what you should be doing is getting more practice when you go through and do this by predicting those products, balancing the equation, and then layering on that next extra piece. Okay. So that you now have more practice at each of those stages, you can increase the odds of getting those other questions right. Does that make sense? So this is a case where there would be no chemical reaction. Understand that? Okay. The bottom one is on there for another reason. I just erased that. Are you okay with me erasing that? Okay. Bottom one's on there for another reason. Let's go through and do that swap. What do we end up with? Copper by itself and then the gold with the sulfate. Why is this one selected to be discussed? Well, when we did that exchange, we had to decide, did we predict a proper balanced product, right? To do that, we had to evaluate the charge on the metal and the charge on our nonmetal. What is the charge on our nonmetal? Um, what is our charge on our nonmetal in this compound? Negative two. We have, and for those of you looking at the periodic table, stop, because it's not on the periodic table. Our nonmetal is a polyatomic ion of sulfur and four oxygens. How would we know what that charge was? We had to memorize that sulfate, SO4, had a minus two charge. So, what I just heard from that is it doesn't matter what's attached to the sulfate, the charge is going to be negative two? Yep. Exactly right. Sulfate will always have a negative two charge. Okay. So how many sulfates do I need to balance out the gold? We would need to know the charge on gold. Are you required to know the charge on gold? No. So how the hell do you balance that if you don't know the charge? <laughs> so now we run into this weird dilemma. Okay. Ultimately, it's a crap question. I wouldn't ask that on a test. The lab asks you to do it sort of. When we're running these single replacements, if you don't know, make the assumption that it is the easiest possible solution. What would be the easiest possible solution for a gold's charge? Two. A positive two. Why does that make it an easy solution? It's, it's now balanced right out of the gate. I don't have to stress about it. Does that make sense? That is a horrible method. Okay. I can't stress that enough. That is a horrible method. But if you're backed into a corner, you need something. That's the only something you can grab a hold of. Okay. I don't like backing you into that corner, and so I avoid that when I can. Okay. So that's why I don't ask that on an exam. Okay. I could say that gold is a plus three. If I give you that information, now you can adjust. If I don't give you that information, you'd have to assume the easiest possible solution. Make sense? Does that reaction happen? 
Same reason as with the silver, gold's lowest, it's lowest on the activity series. It wants to be by itself, which gets us to the next concept, which I'll hold on a second on to answer the next question. Are we going to have that table in this? That table drove nearly all of your predictions here, right? So to be able to answer these, you would need that table. So yes, it's on the test. And for those people being like, well, dang, I wish I knew that in advance. Look at exam one. Look at the front of the exam. It's already on there. It has been given to you since day one. Right? You didn't have to use it, but it's been there, along with your solubility rules. Right? It is a small selection or subset of it because what I'm trying to do is only provide just enough and there's only so much space. Turns out that even this list that I'm showing here is only a partial list. The textbook provides a list as well in the text itself. That's a partial list. A partial list that they don't even really tell you is only partial until you answer questions in the back or in the end of the chapter that reference atoms that aren't in their list. Sweet. Okay. So it is a very partial list. We already addressed actually what things are missing from it. We could do single replacements with the nonmetals. There are no nonmetal uh, sort of on that list, right? So that list is very incomplete, but it covers the vast majority of what you would deal with, right? I did for a second say it doesn't have nonmetals on there, and then I had to balk because hydrogen, hydrogen is on there. Okay, why is hydrogen on there? What defines an acid? Hydrogen. Okay. So acids tend to be very reactive with metals. Why? Because of the single replacement here. And we'll see that in a, a pseudo-mild example here in a second. Okay. Did I address our whole financial system? Okay. Ollie's saying no. You're saying yeah. So let's go ahead and see. Our whole financial system is based off of gold. Why did we pick gold? It doesn't react. If we pick something like lithium... We attack Fort Knox with water balloons. Right? The water reacts with the lithium. The lithium turns into an aqueous solution and falls down the drains. That, that's not a great financial system. So we picked currencies to back our, our finances throughout history based off of metals that did not react with things. Platinum, silver, gold. Okay? So they had to be minimally reactive so that we could actually use them as currencies. Kind of make sense? We also use it for jewelry. Why do we use it for jewelry? It doesn't react with your skin. That's the whole point of them. Wait, I just want to clarify something. So you're saying like the ones that are not reactive, if you like mix it with like sulfate, <clears throat> nitrate, or whatever, and if it's by itself in the equation, that means it's not going to ever like react. Yep. Even with like external like factors coming into it? Or no, because you can definitely throw some stuff at gold, platinum, and silver to make them react. Oh, okay. Okay. So when we talked about reverse, this is the idea of reversibility. Okay. So you can always make something happen. Okay. How much effort do you have to put in to make it happen? Okay. So one of the somewhat famous stories about gold, if you win a Nobel Prize, they give you a big medal. What is that medal made out of? Gold, because gold is valuable, uh, whatever, okay? <clears throat> and so that's super cool. So I forget who it was, but I, hmm, I just forget who it was. Probably a French person would be my guess. Uh, about 19, late 1930s, I think, won a Nobel Prize in his career, and so had the Nobel Prize up on his wall, you know, showing it off how cool it was. Uh, and late 1930s, we're talking, what? What are we talking about, late 1930s? World War II. World War II. And what happens? Germany comes steamrolling through. Well, what are they going to do when they see a gold medal? Take it. Take it, because that now is a financially valuable thing for them to have. So being a resourceful chemist, he took a particular chemical and dropped his gold medal into it. What happened to the gold medal? It dissolved. Because it dissolved, it now just looks like a solution, a liquid, clear solution. 
He left that on the counter because it was too hard to travel with. He assumed he was going to lose it in the process. Okay. After the war came back, the lab thankfully was untouched. Okay. So nothing was really destroyed. Pulled out the solution, reversed the reaction. He had the gold medal. Okay. Nazis run through the lab. They're like, we'll grab anything of value. Why do I need a clear solution? Okay. So yes, gold can be made to react. Okay. And it is a very reversible process. It, is, it, is it nice chemicals? No. Okay. The chemical is technically known as aqua regia. Aqua for water regia. Royalty. It's royal water. Because what can you do with that royal water? You can dissolve gold into it. So it now becomes a very valuable solution because it has gold. Okay? In an invisible form. Okay? So aqua regia is a very nasty chemical concoction that dissolves virtually everything. Okay? Including gold. Nitric acid and hydrochloric acid? I don't remember exactly. It's two big acids, and I'm pretty sure nitric is one of them. Okay? So you're welcome to look it up, which is what it looks like you're doing. Okay? So that's our single replacement reactions. Why do we want to talk about our single replacement reactions? Because that's really what's going to set us up for the next section, which we'll look at in just a second. We talked about hydrogen. There are some metals that are so active that they will react with hydrogen from water. Okay? Not even hydrogen from acids, hydrogen from water. So when you throw sodium into water, what happens? It okay. explodes is a bit dramatic, but yeah. Okay. We get a flame, it spits gas and all that fun stuff. Well, what's happening? <laughs> we could drop sodium into water in this room and we wouldn't all die. So when I think explode, I think like death and mayhem. It's not really death and mayhem. Okay? So it is still going through a single replacement reaction. The metal is replacing the metal, in, but there's no metal in water. Remember what hydrogen is on the periodic table? Top left, it's on the metal side because it reacts like a metal. So what ends up happening in this reaction is if we split this out, Split water up a little bit better. We have HOH. The OH is separate from the H. That red H acts as, as a metal and exchanges with the sodium, which is why we get sodium hydroxide. The H then comes out by itself, and of course it has to be H2 because it's diatomic. That reaction is so exothermic that as soon as the H is formed, it auto-ignites and we get the flame. Okay. So certain metals do that. They're known as active metals. You don't need to know which ones are active metals. I just want to let you know that that's the case. Okay. So why is all this important? Because this is getting us into our play posit. Okay, which I'm sure was everybody's favorite. Let's switch this up. The one you just watched this weekend or was due this weekend. It might have been 20 minutes. It was, I guess, it's like 17 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Five minutes it was short. So that was I think I got you know what I, what I think is hilarious the about that? Is you go out into the rest of the world and you're like, oh, it was a short video. It was only 13 minutes. People are going to be like, what? That's like twice as long as it should be. But you're all like, yeah, it was short. It was only 13 minutes. Because like the other ones are a freaking hour long. Man. You've been trained well. <laughs> That one felt like forever. So if we, <laughs> okay, shh, you don't have to throw me that far under the bus. Okay, so if we looked at the single replacement reaction, let's kind of address what's happening with it. What is the charge on the sodium? Okay, so I like the reference to the plus one. That makes a lot of sense if it was ionic. To be ionic, what would we need? A metal. And a nonmetal. Where's the nonmetal? There isn't one. So it's, it, it, I can't pull from the ionic charges. So where would I find information about the charge? In the upper right hand corner of that symbol. What's in the upper right hand corner? Nothing. What's the charge on that sodium? 
Zero. Okay. What's the charge on the sodium on the reactants? Or so that's the product side. What's the that one is now in an ionic compound. I know that one is now a plus one because it's an ionic compound. What happened to the sodium to go from a zero to a plus one? It lost an electron. It lost an electron. Does anybody see that electron written in the equation? No. No. Okay. That's what makes our single replacement reactions kind of interesting, is that there are electrons moving around, and we have no way of tracking them right now. So what do we need? We need chapter 17 to address that motion of electrons. And that's what we're talking about oxidation and reduction. Okay? And really what those are are just fancy names for the transfer of electrons. Okay? Why do we need fancy names? Why can't I just call it loss of electrons? History. Okay? Oxidation was discovered well before the existence of electrons. What is oxidation in reference to, you think? Oxygen. And ultimately, rusting. I built this boat. It was this awesome boat, and then it sank. Why did it sink? Well, it had all this red stuff on it. Right? Well, let me cover it in paint. Well, now when I cover it in paint, I didn't get that red stuff. Why not? The paint prevented air, oxygen, from touching it. Oh, so when this thing happens, I'm going to call it oxidation because we've increased the interaction with oxygen. What happens if I remove the oxygen? It's not oxidation. It's reduction. I reduced the bonds to oxygen. Oxidation and reduction. That's where the names are coming from. So would you consider the paint the reduction? So the paint is a preventative thing. The paint prevents oxidation. And I kind of suspected someone would go there because the language I was using was suggesting that. And that's not what I meant. Okay. So the paint just re prevents oxidation. But if I could reverse that rust and turn it back into the metal, that would then be reduction. Okay. So certain chemical reactions will undergo these processes, and they have to happen simultaneously because electrons aren't stable. Okay. So if I oxidize something, something else also has to be reduced, and this has to do with that transfer of electrons. If something lost electrons, that means electrons are floating around as products. Okay? If they could just float around as products and exist on their own, that would be problematic for us. Be like, I don't really know about that. Well, try walking. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, if electrons just existed chilling around, floating on their own, what happens when you walk? You would bump into them and get electrocuted. Ta-da! Electrons aren't stable. Right? They have to be partnered or, or controlled in something. Right? So if we have something lose electrons, something else must have gained, gained electrons. So let's take a look at the aluminum. The aluminum started as what charge? A positive three. Okay? Not a zero because the overall compound was zero. Aluminum had to be a plus three to balance out that chloride. What did aluminum end as? Zero. Zero. What happened to the aluminum to go from a plus three to a zero? It had to gain three electrons. There's people, oh, but the number lost. Remember, what are you allowed to move? Electrons and electrons are negative. So to go from a plus three to a zero, you gained more negative. That's why it went down. Interesting observation. That number went down. If your number goes down, that would also be known as a reduction. With the other one, zero to plus one, it didn't go down, so we can't call it reduction. We only have one other choice, oxidation. Okay. So what we're doing within this chapter and ultimately in all compounds now is acknowledging the importance of electrons. Certain reactions cause a transfer of electrons. Not all, but some do. So we now have to consider what is that balance of electrons in a particular reaction? And more importantly, on an individual atom. Because we've already considered the balance of electrons in a compound. That was known as the charge. Okay? And that's where we get kind of some confusion with oxidation state. Okay? The balance of protons and electrons on an atom is oxidation state. The balance of protons and electrons in anything 
is charge. The charge will always be given to you. The oxidation state you need to always solve for. Sometimes it's a trivial solve. Sometimes it's not. Okay? So as we move through and go through and deal with this, what we're trying to do is distinguish that reduction versus oxidation. Ta-da! Right? Same, same, but different. Okay? Oxidation state versus charge. Your oxidation state or number, which I use interchangeably, and I honestly don't know if that's correct, applies to an individual atom. Okay? So you have to say an atom has this oxidation state. The charge applies to a larger unit. That unit could be an atom. For instance, what is the charge in that red box? That charge is zero. How do you know that? Because it doesn't have anything in the upper right-hand corner. The upper right-hand corner is where we specify the charge. What is the oxidation state for calcium in that red box? Okay. You always have to solve for it. So we would have to know the solving process. Okay. Well, charge is the balance of protons and electrons. Oxidation state is also the balance of protons and electrons but for an atom as opposed to a larger thing. So if I add up the oxidation state for every atom, now what do I get? An equation. That would have to equal Zero. the charge. So in this case, what atoms do I have? One. I have one calcium atom times its oxidation state, which I said, I don't know. I have to solve for it. When I add them all, well, what other atom shows up in that red box? Nothing, which then means if I add that all up, that has to equal the overall charge, and the overall charge is zero. One times x equals zero. What must x equal? Zero. It's trivial. Kind of make sense? So what we're trying to do is recognize the relationship between those. Okay? That's where you get the rules Right? And yes, these are modified because you can add on a whole bunch of other things. But these three rules will cover probably 80% of the things that you would ever encounter in chemistry. And I would argue probably 95 to 99% of what you would see in this class. So first and foremost, you need to know your charges on your ionic compounds. Because if you have an ionic compound, you can immediately split that into those individual constituents. So when I look at calcium hydroxide, that could be a hard one to go through and solve. But what I can do is recognize that that is ionic and that calcium in that compound has what charge? A plus two. So now what I'm looking at is calcium plus two. What is the charge on calcium plus two? Plus two. It's in the upper right-hand corner. It's actually stated when we talk about atoms. What is its oxidation state? It is also plus two, but we would see that in our solve when we said one calcium atom times its oxidation state equals the overall charge. X equals plus two. Okay, so it's a trivial solve if you recognize the power of that ionic equation. This is why it's important to be able to distinguish ionic versus covalent. How do we distinguish those? Metal and a nonmetal. The next rule, oxygen will always have a minus 2 oxidation state. What this is coming from has to do with electronegativity. We're now talking about how our atoms collect electrons when they're bonded to the other atoms. What was the definition of electronegativity? Throw that as an exam question. What's that? The definition. Definition of electronegativity. The ability to steal an electron from another atom. Also said, the ability to steal an electron from a bond. You're literally putting these in bonds. Right? So the oxidation states that we're talking about and presenting are coming from electronegativities. Am I talking too much? Need to shower more? Oh, no, that's okay. Just checking. I just want to make sure. That's okay. 
So why would oxygen always have a minus 2? For it to be a minus 2, it would always have to steal electrons. It has nothing to do with its diatomic characteristics. Because it only has six negative electrons. No. So does sulfur, so does selenium, so does tellurium. Oxygen top of what? The electronegativity scale. In electronegativity terms, oxygen is the second most electronegative element. It also shows up in a ton of different compounds. That's why we reference oxygen. It shows up in so many compounds that we actually invented a name to describe the reaction with oxygen. Oxidation. oxidation. Right? So it is incredibly common. So it's super important to have an oxidation state. Right? When is it not a minus 2? <laughs> Say that again? <clears throat> no. When it's over in another compound? Nope. When it's not. What'd you say? When it's not? When it's not an oxidation state. No. When it's not minus 2? <laughs> yes. Sorry. The only thing I remember from the play was oxidation. Oxygen is negative 2. Oxygen is negative 2, and that's an important thing. So what I'm asking you to do is now really process out, why did we say it was a negative 2? Because we had memory. Yes. No, that's not why we said it. We literally just walked through it. Why was oxygen always a negative 2? <coughs> it is very high on the electronegativity scale. So much so that it steals electrons from every other atom. Except... Fluorine. Fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, which means if I bond oxygen next to fluorine, what happens? Fluorine takes the electrons away from the oxygen. So oxygen, by definition, can't be negative two. That's one exception. There's two. No, come on. Oh, when oxygen is itself. When oxygen is bonded to itself, okay, now there's an equal split on those electrons. And it can't just steal them all because you're now saying one oxygen is more electronegative than another. Okay? So you know those exceptions. You know where those things are coming from. Ultimately, the biggest thing you need is that oxygen should have a minus 2 oxidation state. After that, the sum of the oxidation, and this is all fun stuff, there's an equation. You just sum the oxidation state for every single atom in an individual formula. Right? If we went to something like this, we could say the oxidation state for calcium plus the oxidation state for oxygen, plus the oxidation state for hydrogen. Oh, but there's two, which means I have another oxygen and I have another hydrogen, right? That looks kind of obnoxious. So what do we do? Calcium plus two times oxygen plus two times hydrogen. The number of times the element shows up in that particular compound. That's the condensed formula. Okay? That formula should look incredibly familiar. It looks exactly like the formula I told you to use for nomenclature. Okay? So if you've been doing nomenclature the way I asked you to do with balancing out charges, oxidation state is now just, oh, and you don't want me to call it charge anymore. You want me to call it oxidation state. Okay, simple fix. If you've been doing some other method to come up with names other than balancing out charges, life just became really crappy because now you have to learn a whole nother system. This is why I stack things. Multiple hands. I think I saw Ernesto first and then... I can be last, but... Okay. okay um, how often will hydrogen still have an oxidation state of one? Hydrogen it's very it's commonly it's has a, a plus one. Okay? It has to do with what it's being bonded to. So don't stress on that because I won't ask that all that often. So are we phasing out the word charge in place of oxidation? Does charge disappear? No. 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 We still need charge. But we have to recognize when we use charge. Charge is in reference to typically a compound. But it's any unit. Okay? The oxidation state applies to atoms. So sometimes your unit is an atom. Sometimes it's something much larger. Okay? So they're referencing the same idea, the balance of protons and electrons, it's just across different systems. The analogy that kind of works, if we think about budgets, there's an annual budget, right? You can spend however many thousands of dollars in a year. Okay? That budget is different than your daily budget. Okay? Hopefully. 
Well, not hopefully. Ideally, they'd be the same, right? That would be cool. (laughs) But they're going to be different. The same thing is happening here. It's still a balance of, of money. It's just a question on when you're referencing it. Do you reference it for the individual days that make up the whole year, or do you look at it as just the whole year? Individual days. Okay. Well, it depends on what you're concerned about. Okay. So that may change day to day, because you may decide, oh, I really have to buy a car. That's going to use up my budget for the next six months. So I can buy a car, but now I can't eat for six months. Okay. Because the annual budget has only so much that you can do with that. Ernesto. So why is sulfate the SO4 and nitric and O3? What is the formula for nitrogen? N. Why is it not NI? That's nickel. Because that's nickel. Okay, so why is the formula for nickel NI and not N? Okay, so you could reference first versus last, uh, which kind of works in sequence there, but beryllium versus boron. Boron was found chronologically first, so it got B, but beryllium got B. BE. But beryllium is first on the periodic table, right? Okay. So there is a logic in a sense behind that naming system. Do you need that logic and sense to be able to tell me that beryllium is BE and boron is B? No. no. So don't. No, no, my, my question why is why? So why is SO4, SO4, and NO3, NO3? That's the exact same thing. Yeah, you are trying to put a rule behind that. There is a rule that has logical sense, just like there's a rule behind the logical sense of which element names go with which symbols. Does that change your understanding of that element or symbol? No. So if you care, go for it. And you can look up that system. It is not something you want to spend time discussing because it's not going to help you manipulate it. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. When it comes to nitrogen being N versus nickel being Ni, I have gone through 20 years of chemistry study, never knew why nitrogen got N and nickel got Ni. It has no bearing on your ability to manipulate it. It has no bearing on your ability to know that sulfate should be SO4 and not SO3. Okay. All you need to know is what it is. If I changed my name, does that all of a sudden change who I am? No. Legally. Legally, So Heather Heather probably appreciates the oneness that it represents. So what do we do with this? So what we do with this is we now have to apply it to a, a, a chemical reaction. So if I looked at this chemical reaction, I want to decide, did did I exchange electrons? To understand if I exchanged electrons, what am I going to have to do? know the oxidation states for each and every single atom. Well, how many atoms are up there? Three. How many atoms are up there? There's six. You're like, but I only see iodine, oxygen, and carbon. On the reactant side, you also have iodine, oxygen, and carbon on the product side. Those could very much be different oxidation states, which means every time you see a symbol, you must determine its oxidation state. So let's real quickly look at an example. Let's take a look at I2O5. Is it ionic? No metals, so it's not ionic. So I can't use rule one. Officially, I should then jump to rule three. I have iodine plus iodine plus oxygen plus oxygen plus oxygen plus oxygen. And then this would have to, damn it, plus oxygen. And then this would have to equal the overall charge. What is the overall charge for that? How do you know it's zero? We look at the upper right-hand corner. There's nothing written there, so it must be zero. Okay. 
To do it for each and every single one of those could be a bit redundant, so what we could write instead would be 2 times I plus 5 times oxygen equals 0. Notice we have an issue with oxygen, right? Yeah, oxygen looks like 0, so be careful with that. Okay. Would I be able to solve that? Yes. How many solutions are there? You're like, there's only one. No. Two. No. Uh, Begins with an I. There are an infinite number of solutions to that. Okay. Don't stress on that infinite aspect, but there are an infinite number of solutions, one of which is correct. That one that is correct is because we need to know that oxygen is negative two. a negative 2. 5 times negative 2, 2 times our iodine. This has to equal 0. 2 times iodine equals plus 10. Iodine equals plus 5. Okay. We had to know that extra equation to solve this. One equation with two unknowns, infinite solutions. Okay. If I want only one solution, I need two equations, one unknown. That second equation that we used was that oxygen equals minus 2. So how are you, because uh, iodine is supposed to be negative one charge. No. When is iodine a negative one? Technically when it says so, yeah, keep going. Nope. When it's by itself, it's actually a zero. Close. This is in a compound. It's not minus one. When is iodine minus one? When it's connected to what? When it's connected to minus one? No. When it's Close. To when it's connected to a metal. Remember all those charges we told you to memorize? If you take a look back and look at the title of that slide, it said not just charges, it said ionic charges, meaning it's minus one when it is ionic. How do I know it's ionic? Metal and a nonmetal. Okay. This is not a metal and a nonmetal, so I can't use the charges. What becomes extra confusing on that is you'd be like, well, isn't the charge I memorized for oxygen was a minus 2? It also happens to be its oxidation state. Oxidation state and charge overlap in a lot of cases. It is not a guarantee. You have to keep them separate. Okay. So what does that mean now? We've now determined the oxidation state for our oxygen. Okay. And interestingly enough, we determined it both sides of the equation to be a minus 2, because we said it is defined as that, okay? except when it's bonded to fluorine or itself. itself. And we've also now found the plus 5. You've done half of the work, so what do you have to do? The other half of the work. Yay! So we would now have this system where we've identified all of those oxidation states. And we can say, well, what changed to go from a plus 5 to a 0? Gain electrons. Right? It had to gain electrons to go from a plus 5 to a 0. That's why the number went down. What happened to the oxygen? No Nothing. What happened to the carbon? Lost electrons. It lost electrons. Okay? And that's where we're getting those statements. Okay? Again, those statements come when we understand that we have electrons. That was 1900. Rust was a hell of a lot earlier than 1900. Okay? So we have these reactions. We know these things are happening. We just don't know why they're happening. The why is our electrons. So we can now explain why they're happening, but the names for those don't make any sense. So there's a historical name. Okay? That historical name is associating the gain of electrons with... What happened to the state or the number? It changed. Yes, it changed. What happened to the number? Plus 5 to 0. It went decreased. It was reduced. <laughs> Gain of electrons is reduction. The loss of electrons is oxidation. oxidation. You might be like, well, there's not some little cute acronym that you can look at with the numbers there. It's an increase in oxygen bonds. What atom was oxidized? Carbon. Take a look at your carbon on the reactant side. How many bonds to oxygen does it have? How many oxygens are there? One. Look at carbon on the product side. How many bonds to oxygen does it have? Two. 
What did we do? Increase the bonds to oxygen. Ta-da! Carbon was oxidized. Okay? So we now need to associate this gain of electrons and loss of electrons with the appropriate nomenclature associated with that. That's where we get loss of electrons as oxidation or gain of electrons as reduction. I'm pretty sure I ranted about it in the video, so I'm going to rant minimally about it here. Leo says grr. Leo because... Shh, not yet. <laughs> Leo. Leo is another name for lion. If we've got our Greek, and what do li lions are ultimately just really big cats. And cats, grr. Leo the lion says grr. Ta-da. It's all about life. It's cool. It's things we see. It's funny. Okay. And instead, what do biologists memorize? Oil rig. Oxidation is lost. Loss of what? Loss of pineapples, loss of my pants, okay? What, what are we losing, okay? A freaking sanity with this stupid acronym, okay? And they use oil rig, okay? And I find it extra fun because, right, biology is the study of life. And literally, what is oil? Death. Not only is it, it's, it's, it's what's left after everything dies, that's oil. And not only that, we're now pumping it out so that we can kill everything with the repercussions of it. Like, seriously, bio I don't understand biologists sometimes. Like, Quick, this is just... Quick, by saying Leo says her. Everybody say, one, two, three, go. <laughs> yeah, and they'll say freaking oil rig. It's just, it's stupid. Okay? And uh, it's just, yeah, whatever. So, in any case. So... <clears throat> Here we go. If that wasn't enough, so here's the fun one. Oxidizing agent. Okay? Okay? If I was a secret agent, would I be working for the US? Okay? If I was a secret agent, would it make sense with my location yes. to be working for the US? Yes. No. No, why not? I'm, I'm literally in the U.S. spying for... What am I spying on if I'm in the U.S.? So if I'm going to be a secret agent, I'm not going to be for the U.S. I'm going to be for Russia, for China. I'm not going to be in the state that I'm a secret agent for. That's stupid. Okay? I'm not spying on anything at that point. Okay? Don't bring in the whole double agent thing. Don't. Just don't. <laughs> So, an oxidizing agent. What happened to the oxidizing agent? Remember, it's a spy for the other one. So the oxidizing agent was reduced. The oxidizing agent caused something else to be oxidized. That something else had to lose electrons. Well, who the heck gains electrons if that something else loses electrons? The other one, the one that caused that oxidation to happen. Okay? So an oxidizing agent was actually reduced. The reducing agent is the opposite. The reducing agent was actually oxidized. So they are opposites of each other. That is confusing, but it is relevant. So you might be like, well, why do I care? To label oxidation and reduction, we needed a chemical equation, right? So I had to have a chemical reaction. Oxidizing agent, I can now assign to a species, okay? And say that this species will cause things to be oxidized. Why do I care? Well, this species will cause things to be reduced. If I don't have this label on them that one is an oxidizing agent and one is a reducing agent, what might I accidentally do in the lab? I might put them next to each other. I get a small chemical spill. What happens? Kaboom. There goes the lab. But if I have the label on it that it's an oxidizing agent and I have a label on it that says it's a reducing agent, I can be like, don't freaking put those next to each other because if there's a spill, it blows up. So let's put them as far away from each other as possible. Those labels help with safety. Right? It doesn't necessitate a chemical reaction to associate that label with it. Okay? That's why we have those terms. Okay? 
So when we're looking at our chemical reactions through this chapter, what you are responsible for is identifying your oxidation states. Not only are you responsible for identifying the oxidation states, you have to decide what happened to that element. Was it oxidized or was it reduced? Okay. So we got oxidation states. We've got defining oxidation and reduction. What did we also just throw at you? Agents. The agents. So you now also have to be able to label the agents. What is our process for going through and doing that? Okay. We're going to pick the middle one because the middle one's a little bit more troublesome. Oxidation state for our copper on the reactant side. Zero. How do you know it's zero? So our copper is zero. What is the oxidation state in our nitrate? Negative one. The charge is negative one. I intentionally phrased that question vaguely. The oxidation state for nitrate, there's two of them because there are two atoms within it. I would have to look for the nitrogen. There's one nitrogen plus three times the oxygen. This equals negative one. The oxygen I know to be a negative two, I can thereby figure out that the nitrogen must be one. I'll let, leave you to figure out that math, plus five. What is the oxidation state for the copper on the product side? Plus two. Whoops. Yep, it'll be a plus two. It's one of those trivial ones. What is the oxidation state for our nitrogen dioxide? Again, I'm being a jerk. The oxidation state does not apply to a molecule. There's two atoms, so I would have to do nitrogen, two oxygens, equals our overall charge of zero. We know oxygen has a negative two oxidation state. The nitrogen has, has to be a plus four. I didn't show the algebra on the nitrogen for either side. You should be able to go through and work those out. So now what do we do? What happened to the copper? It lost electrons. If it loses electrons, L, E, it is oxidation. Thank you. <laughs> it would be oxidation. If it was oxidized, what does that mean about its agent status? Reductant. I'll accept reductant. That ant, or you could call it a reducing agent. Both of those would be acceptable. What happened to the oxygen? Nothing, so I don't really care about it. What happened to the nitrogen? It gained electrons, which means reduction. What kind of agent? Oxidizing agent or oxidant. Make sense? All of that labeling is something that I would highly encourage you to go through and write out every time you go through and solve these. That does look like a lot of work. Okay? That's what you should be doing. And for those of you being like, well, that's a lot of work. Okay, get it wrong. That's fine too. Okay, that is your choice though. Okay? Some of this you can internalize. I don't recommend, recommend internalizing anything because your brain is a scary, freaky place to be. Don't start doing math in scary freaking places. Places, places. Yeah. Does that make sense? I would argue you should take a look at the practice exam, exam and decide. Okay. Um, the easiest answer is going to be that I would probably give you at least some hint that you're moving towards an oxidation state question. Okay. One big hint, we talked about this in conjunction with charges. technically charges, yeah. What started this whole conversation today? 
Not electronegativity. The activity chart with, single yes, replacement. single replacement reactions. Single replacement reactions are your default um, oxidation reduction question. Okay. So that slide has a bunch of practice on it. And yeah, I know. Okay, you just have to change the size of the box, stupid reformatting. Okay. Um, what I do want to really quickly walk through is a couple quick, uh, yeah, we'll just do these really quickly um, just to give you an idea on it because you should be doing these conversions over the weekend. The rest of the slides are just conversions but with different measurements. So it's not new content, it's just do a conversion, show your work, and then we'll be done um, a little bit later than Greg went in. I apologize. Right. So what do I want? Convert from milligrams to grams. Okay. So that's giving me a whole statement. I don't want convert milligrams to grams. I want, what do I want? Mass. Mass as a measurement of? Weight. Grams. Grams. What's the unit that I want? Just grams. I just want grams. I don't want milligrams. I want grams. That's it. That's, that's what I want. Okay. To get a nursing degree, you don't say, I want... An education and the internship and the process and all of the nursing. You say, I want a nursing degree. Okay. End with that goal. What did we start with? Milligrams. Milligrams. Okay. Notice, what did I write first? Milligrams. I wrote milligrams. I didn't actually write the number. The number follows the unit. Now that I know I want that number, or that unit, I'll place it there. Why did I place that unit in the numerator? What is milligrams a measure of? Mass is where I was going. Where's, what is grams a measure of? Mass. In my answer, where do I have my mass? Numerator or denominator? Numerator, which means where should my mass be? In the numerator. I now need to do a conversion. In this conversion, I need my halves to be in the denominator, and I need my wants to be in the numerator. Does that conversion factor exist? Yes. yes. Now that I know it exists, now I can bring in numbers. Those numbers that I'm going to bring in are according to how I told you to memorize it. Milli meant, you should work on that, 10 to the minus 3. The power of 10 will always go with the core unit. The core unit here is grams. One goes down here. There are other ways to memorize this, and I'm going to tell you right now, you will screw it up if you do it differently. So I can do 1 over 1,000? You will screw it up eventually. You can't yep. put it over 1,000? It's there not that you can't put it over a thousand, it's that there's so many different ways you actually have to memorize more information to put it over a thousand than you do to just memorize that milli means ten to the minus three. Wait, how okay. many kilos? Milli kilo centi. Okay. So if we look at the units now, the milligrams cancel, what unit would I have? What unit did I want? Grams. Now I can bust out my calculator and do the solve. 325, everything in the numerator, divided by everything in the denominator. So 325 times 10 to the minus 3. I can punch it into my calculator. You want to do a decimal shifty thing? By all means, go ahead and do so. You'll regret it later. Punch it into the calculator, okay, and get an answer. Okay? Make it a little bit more complicated. Let's look at this one. What am I solving for? Micrograms. Micrograms is the silly looking mu symbol. Micro equals 10 to the negative 6. 300, whoop, let's actually push how I wanted to talk about. Milligrams, there's 325 milligrams. What do I want? Micrograms, what do I have? Milligrams. Is that a given conversion factor? No, it's actually not given. Okay, so I need to choose what I want to convert milligrams to. Grams is a nice one because what I can then foresee is that what do I have? Micrograms. What do I have? Oh, no, 
Milligrams are canceled. What do I have? I have grams. What do I want? Micrograms. Is that a valid conversion factor? Yes. yes. Micro meant 10 to the negative 6. Where does your power of 10 go? Core unit. Core unit. Milli meant 10 to the negative 3. Where does it go? No, it does not go on top. It also does not go on the bottom. You're like, there's only two places. Your language is not appropriate. Try again. Nope. 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 By you associating, it goes on top. Where are you going to place that number? Always, from here on out. On top. Does it always go on top? No. That's why you're wrong. Yes. What does it go with? It goes with the core unit. What is the core unit? Grams. It goes with the core unit. That's where my power of 10 goes. Those people are like, it's on top. It's, again, a language thing. As soon as you start saying you place it on top, every time you solve, you place the number on top, and that will be wrong. Place it with the core unit. It will always work. It's lovely. Okay? With that, I have to stop 